Welcome to St George's College and for this introduct introduction to Lent video. Because of the war in Gaza and the terrible experiences that uh, all the people of these lands are having, it's not possible for pilgrims to come to visit us here in the land and here at St George's. So we're delighted to be able to share with you these views of the Holy Land which we hope will help to give you um, a wonderful Holy Land introduction to Lent. And in the midst of the pain that we're experiencing, and on behalf of all the staff of the college, we hope that you will continue to pray for us uh, and strive for an end to the suffering here in these lands. And we send you very best wishes for a holy and fruitful Lent. Thank you. The journey of Lent ends at Gagatha, the place of Jesus' crucifixion, right located here, right behind me, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. From the springs of Caesarea Philippi, from the Tiberian Sea, from the hills and plains of the Galilee, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem and he journeyed here to the holy city. Jesus entered through the gates of the city on the back of a lowly uh, donkey. And then following that day after day, he went to the temple where he listened and laughed, where he prayed and participated, where he comforted and challenged others. But Jesus' journey to Jerusalem did not end at the city gates, nor did it end at the temple. Rather, it ended here at the, at the rock of Gagatha, the place of the skull, the place of Jesus' execution. Gagatha is a place of convergence for pilgrims. Day after day, pilgrims here come to Gagatha, and we've spoken about the context of the war that we know everyone's praying for. Even on our courses, the, the Stations of the Cross lead pilgrims here to commemorate and observe Jesus' death and crucifixion. Likewise, our journeys wherever we live in the world bring us here too to Jerusalem as well. Whatever theme we're using, whatever fast we choose, we set our face to, to Jerusalem during this 40-day journey. And step by step, every day we come closer to the holy city. But it's different living here in Jerusalem. Oh, there'll be the, the week of Holy Week services when we're observing that here in the city. But an old tradition of the Palestinian monks took them out of the city for the early part of Lent before they returned for Palm Sunday. Now, Byzantine monasticism in, in Jerusalem and the Holy Land uh, was very big, especially during the, the 5th, 6th, and into the 7th century. Most of the monks lived elsewhere and came to the Holy Land to settle. And one of them, Saint Euthemius of Armenia, he wasn't the first monk to come, but he's often credited as being the, the father or the founder of, of many monasteries. He came here in, in the 400s, and one of his traditions was always to leave his monastery near here and go down to the innermost desert, the utter desert in the Jordan River Valley near the Dead Sea. And he would spend time there between the Feast of Epiphany until Palm Sunday, where he would withdraw from human society. He would have solitude with God and he would nourish his soul as he contemplated the wilderness experience of Jesus, also in the ascetic example of Elijah and John the Baptist. In this Lenten video series, we too will go out into the desert and we will follow in the footsteps of Saint Euthemius. We talk in our courses that not only do we follow in the footsteps of Jesus as Christians and as, as pilgrims, but we often walk in the footsteps of those who walked in the footsteps of Jesus. So we're going to appeal to the tradition of Saint Euthemius, 
but there's another figure that we want to introduce who's intimately associated with this building as well as the desert. She's the desert mother, Mary the Egyptian. According to her story, she was a prostitute in, in, in Egypt and she came with a band of pilgrims for the sep annual September eight-day feast of the dedication of the Holy Sepulchre. The second day was the Feast of the Holy Cross. And as she was trying to enter the building with a group of pilgrims, an invisible force refused her entry into the building. She tried several times and she eventually saw an icon of Mary, the mother of God, the Theotokos, on the facade of the church. She repented of her lifestyle to that icon and she was allowed to enter into the Holy Sepulcher to venerate the Holy Cross. She came back out to the icon where the icon told her to go to the Jordan River, to the other side of the Jordan River, where she would find, where she would find peace. We'll tell the rest of the story that happens to uh, Mary the Egyptian when we're in the desert, but we will follow these two characters, uh, Mary the Egyptian and, and Euthemius, out to the desert. But Mary's not forgotten here as well. She's not forgotten in the desert. That story would have originally taken place on the eastern side of the, of the church. Uh, the church was destroyed in, in the 11th century. And when the main entrance moved here to the south where I'm standing now, so did her memory and her commemoration. Now just behind, behind me here to the left is a, is, is a chapel. I've never seen it open, but it is in fact dedicated to Mary uh, the Egyptian. So uh, these saints, uh, the, the monks of Palestine, again, they journeyed into the desert to find solitude and find this profound experience of God during the season of Lent. Mary the Egyptian's own story will end, as we'll hear, on Holy Thursday. So come with us. We invite you on this Lenten journey as we take you into the desert for our Lenten journey that will ultimately bring us back to the rock of Golgotha, and then Easter looms in the shadows at the tomb of Jesus and the resurrection of Easter morning. We're here in the Jordan River Valley, where Mary the Egyptian lived for 47 years, mostly just across the Jordan River here to my right. The rest of her story goes something like this. When she was old and frail, she was found by the priest Zosimus. She told the priest her story and asked that he would meet her the following year on Holy Thursday to give her communion. He did that and she asked him to come back the next year. And when he returned the second year on Holy Thursday, he found her body deceased on the ground and near her head was a message written in the sand saying that she had died uh, the very day that he had given her Holy Communion the year before. The desert gives and the desert takes away. What does one need to live in the desert? And what do we need to sustain our Lenten journey? The story of Mary the Egyptian is one of repentance and obedience and faith. It's full of scarcity and plenty and her story is the paradigm of Lent. And she's not forgotten. The churches here in the valley on both sides of the river are full of her images and her icons. Now, along with Mary the Egyptian, this valley up and down the Jordan River, not too far from the Dead Sea, is a historic place of Palestinian monasticism. It's a difficult place, intense heat, scarcity of rain. And in the Byzantine times, there were still lions and other very dangerous creatures. There were some full-time year-round monasteries and, and hermits living in the valley. But for the most part, Palestinian monasticism was centered in bands closer to Jerusalem. There on the very top of the ridge of Jerusalem, 
there was enough water and a, a ways of producing agriculture that gave rise to large communities of monks, communal monasteries. And halfway down the ridge between here and Jerusalem, Palestinian monasticism pioneered an innovative way of the religious life known as laras, which is similar to the Arabic word or sukh, which means lane or a marketplace. The arrangement was a number of individual monks living in cave cells and a central area of a church and a communal building. The monks would live in their cells throughout the week in prayer and in solitude, making baskets, or ropes, or other handicrafts. And on the weekends, they would gather then at the communal center where they would share in worship in common meals, and they would exchange their goods that they had made throughout the week for more supplies and food for the following week. Monastic life in Palestine was different from that in Egypt, in Syria. For unlike those two places, the holy city was never far away. And whether it was a laura or a monastery, they're all almost within walking distance of the holy city. And the Christian holy places were understood to contain God's presence in a very, very special and powerful way. But the desert was different. And it was to this desert that monks would come either from the monasteries or Loris between the Feast of Epiphany and Palm Sunday to spend their Lent in this harsh desert environment. While the desert could be located as an actual place, it was not primarily a geographical concept. It was the place where the monk went to experience isolation and to spend time in solitude with God. But the desert had two different contradictory ideas. The first was as a place of beauty and purity, where people could go away from the pollution and the corruption of the cities. The Christian scholar Origen in the third century, talking about the life and ministry of the John the Baptist, said that John was fleeing the towns in order to go out into the desert where the air is pure, the sky is opened, and God is closer. The other concept of desert is that it's a sterile place, a place where life is threatened, a place that is full of, of demons, devils, and wild beasts. So the monk went into the desert to experience peace, but while he was there, he was fighting demons and devils in a very inhospitable place. The Palestinian monk's experience of the desert is very similar to the experience of the Israelites in the wilderness. The wilderness for the Israelites was a pl place that was formless, chaotic, and lifeless. It was a place that was destructive and hostile, a place where people murmured and protested. It was a place full of hunger. But what they experienced in the wilderness was that life-giving resources did not come from the land. They came from God. God nourished them and fed them. And so there was life. Day by day, God gave them food. And for those who could faithfully live in the, in the wilderness, there was life, there was peace, and there was a new day. Lessons from the desert, lessons of Lent. Now we might spend just a few moments talking more about actually where we are. We are just about a half mile behind the, the present day monastery of St. Drasmos, where we take groups uh, a number of times. It's, it's, it's a Greek monastery pretty much on the road here in the Jordan River Valley. Uh, this historical site, and we're part of it now, actually uh, 
Saint Drasmos was a saint who, who followed Saint Euthemius into the desert. And this is one of the exceptions in this Jordan Valley where there was year-round monks during the Byzantine period in the, in the 5th, 6th, and into the, the 7th, uh, 7th century. What was unique about this place is it was both a communal monastery, but also it was a Laura. A Laura again, uh, where monks spent weeks, the weekday, in cells outside and around the communal center, and would go back to the communal center for the weekend for meals, worship, and for handicrafts. Now it is just right behind me uh, where there are a number of these say uh, cave cells that have been cut into the rock. What we have here in the in the Jordan Plain as we are kind of descending down towards the river is a uh, geological formation which is known as marl. It's just chalky, chalky rock. There are no uh, natural caves here. It's kind of a badlands area, but there are, there is the ability to make artificial caves here. And what we have is just in this ridge here is about uh, up, to, up to 10 or, or, or so caves where uh, Byzantine monks stayed right here uh, again from, uh, from the uh, uh, late 5th into the 6th, 6th century. Uh, they would then go uh, near here where it was the, uh, uh, the community uh, center again for, for, for worship and, and, and weekend events. And the modern site, which is uh, uh, about a half mile from here, is uh, uh, named after Drasimos today, uh, but was not exactly the historical uh, site, which is more uh, here in the desert. We're here in the limestone hills of the Judean, Judean wilderness, not far from one of the first monastic sites uh, during the Byzantine period. We're here in the band of where a lot of the Lauras were, uh, where the monks lived in the cells and came together uh, on the weekends. And not far from my right, I can see the top of the, of, of the Jerusalem Ridge where there were larger monasteries. It was from this area that St. Euthemius went down to the inner uttermost desert to spend his time of Lent. And then he comes back. He comes back to this area for Palm Sunday and Holy Week, so he's here for Easter. These Lenten traditions of the Holy Land remind me of what Sister Giovanna of Assisi told me when I met her in, a, in Italy years ago. She said the three great moments of life are the hermitage, the pilgrimage, and community. During times of hermitage, which is what we've been exploring in, in thinking about the lives of the Palestinian monks, times of hermitage, we spend time alone with God, in solitude, in prayer, just by ourselves with God. In pilgrimage, Pilgrimage in this concept is life out on the streets, everyday life where we hear the cries of one another and we help people. It's our everyday life. And then in community, community is coming together where we share with one another our experiences of the street and our experiences of God. Palestinian traditions of the monastic life during the Byzantine period also had a bit of this hybrid spending time alone, spending time in community. And Euthemius savored his time, his time of solitude, but he was also a teacher and an abbot and a leader of other people. Lent is a time of thinking through these three great moments of life as we balance our lives, as we focus on the different aspects of God, ourselves, and others. This Lenten practice is the epitome of the hermitage. And Lent calls us to think through the hermitage experiences, time alone with God. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness, but often he just simply withdrew from crowds in order to spend time. And Lent calls us to do the same, perhaps in longer blocks of time, but even in short increments because it's the hermitage experiences that equip us, resource us for time out in the streets where we care, love, and give a compassion to one another. 
It's times in the hermitage, time alone with God, that make us celebrate and appreciate Christian community even more. Hermitage, pilgrimage, community. These are the three great moments of life, and sometimes the hermitage will leave us in the wilderness. But we're never too far from the Holy City. And even in Lent, we're never too far from Easter. We've heard Rodney talk about the history of the significance of this desert uh, down through the centuries in Christian tradition. And we often think of the desert as vast expanses of nothing and nobody able to live, uh, wanting to live in it for tens or even hundreds of miles. It's not so with this desert, so near to Jerusalem. It was actually at times in Christian history quite a busy desert in that here, there and many other places there were Christian communities. But each one of them was trying to capture something of the desert ministry of St. John the Baptist, perhaps also Elijah, and of course of Jesus in his wilderness temptations. And all the desert, although the desert has been busy-ish, uh, not like Jerusalem, but not like we imagine the desert, there was also plenty of space for solitude and stillness and quiet. And yes, of course, deserts are inhospitable and often dangerous places, but they were also a gift to those who came here because it enabled them, like John the Baptist, to head out of Jerusalem down into the Jordan River Valley and to be a contrast to the moors and values of the city, to call people to change, to repentance, to leave things of their life behind which were life damaging or crushing and to move towards the things of God which are holy and beautiful and true and life affirming. And that's really what we're trying to encapsulate also in Lent. To step away from some of those things which are distracting that cause us to be preoccupied on things which are perhaps superficial or harmful to us. And by taking a step away to reappraise our lives, to see our life in a new way. Jesus was here most likely in this part of the desert because it is so near to Jerusalem and so near to the site of John the Baptist's ministry. And it certainly for him would have been a place of absence, unlikely to have met any person. But the desert then and the desert now is not devoid of life. You can see here right next to me there are shrubs. There are some, this being uh, uh, in the rainy season, there are a few flowers and water will flow down in the valley. There are birds, there are animals. It is not devoid of life. And these things would have been a gift to Jesus by leaving behind the pressures of life and of the ministry that he was beginning to come to terms with. He would have been able to focus on the things of God here in this beautiful place, the desert, and for us too, by leaving behind things that are damaging we perhaps see again the things around us which we too often ignore or miss. And to look within to our own wildernesses and fruitful places within to allow God to bring these out in a time of change and retreat uh, in Lent. In Hebrew, the word for desert actually shares the same linguistic root as the word for talking. It seems strange. It seems unlikely 
that that would be the case because we think of the desert as a place of silence. But in Jewish thinking, and therefore in the Hebrew language, the desert has been known as a place where God talks because Moses encountered Yahweh in the desert. And most famously, of course, on Mount Sinai, Sinai the words of the Ten Commandments were given. The word of God was communicated to the people through those tablets, and that word has stayed with them and with us ever since. So if the desert is a place of God talking, we have to be in an orientation of listening. And when we bring our pilgrims here to this desert, which we always do, we encourage them to go and find a place on their own, a distance away from anybody else, to capture that sense of solitude. And it can take a few moments, a few minutes, before you even begin to notice what's here. And your eyes and your ears become attuned to what is actually here, not the things that we miss because we're in a rush or we're chattering or preoccupied with our phone or whatever else it might be. So the discipline of coming into the desert requires some focus. And the discipline of going into the season of Lent also requires a discipline of focus that is different. And we hope by you seeing these bits of the desert in these few minutes, that it will help you also to have a sense of the desert place that you may be able to find in your place, wherever you are in the world. The desert calls to us all and invites us to spend time away, contemplating, praying. Jesus came into the desert with the words of God's voice, this is my beloved son, ringing in his ears. And we should never lose sight of the love that encapsulates and embraces us in Christ. But Jesus came out of the desert declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. And I hope, I pray that your time of contemplation through Lent will give you a sense of the nearness of God's kingdom of justice, joy and peace which calls us to action too, calls us to be a part of the action of God for the values of God's kingdom, which this world, in its state of war and pain and division and hatred, so desperately needs. May your desert time be a gift to you as the desert was a gift to the monks down through the ages of Christian history.